Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the all-new Chewy RZ box. Now they do make a couple variants, but this is the brand new one powered by the Ryzen 7 5800H. And it should offer a nice little uplift in CPU and GPU performance over their last model, which had the 4800H. And when it comes down to it, you can get this in a couple different configurations. The one I have here has 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM running at 3200 megahertz and a 512 gigabyte M.2 NVMe SSD. But if you really want it, you can go up to 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte drive. But we do have some upgradability to this thing. And when it comes to the RZ box design, I've always been a big fan of it from the original RZ box. We've got a top and bottom full aluminum casing here. The midsection is going to be plastic. But unfortunately, they don't use any of this extra aluminum that they have for cooling the CPU off. It could make a big difference because there's a lot of metal here to extract heat from that CPU. Inside of the box, you're going to get a user manual, a 90 watt power supply, and the RZ box itself. There's not much else going on in here. There's no mounting system for the RZ box, but this can be laid vertically or horizontally. Taking a look at the I.O. up front here, we've got one USB 2.0 port, and I really wish this was upgraded to a 3.0 port. USB Type-C, audio in, audio out, and obviously we've got our power button. Moving around back, we've got our power input, full-size display port, full-size HDMI, they even have VGA here, two more USB 2.0 ports, and dual gigabit ethernet. Was really hoping for 2.5 on this new model, but they've left it with dual gigabit. Upgrading the storage and RAM is really easy. We've got SODIMM RAM here, dual slots, this is running in dual channel, we've got 16 gigabytes. We've also got two M.2 slots, and with the 512 gigabyte model that I have here, we've got one free, so we can always upgrade that storage pretty easily just by pulling this cover off. And like I mentioned, the top and the bottom are aluminum, but unfortunately they don't utilize any of this extra metal to cool this CPU off. And with the original RZ box, it did get a bit hot with that 4800H. I was under the impression that the cooler would have been upgraded in this model, and if we pull this black plastic shroud off, you can see that they had plenty of room to add a longer fin array in this, and that would have definitely made a difference. Or, just like I thought with the original 4800H model, they could have used this cover here to help cool the whole system off. There's plenty of aluminum here to extract heat from that APU. But when it comes to the specs of the new RZ box, for the CPU we've got the Ryzen 7 5800H. This is based on Zen 3, it's a 45 watt part, and it is running at 45 watts in this unit. We've got 8 cores, 16 threads, base clock of 3.2 GHz with a boost up to 4.4, built-in Radeon Vega 8 graphics at 2000 MHz, we've got 16 GB of DDR4 in here running at 3200 MHz in dual channel, but this will support up to 64. I've got a 512 GB M.2 NVMe SSD, it does have Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and right out of the box this is running Windows 11. So I've had the unit up and running for a little while. Everything's really snappy and I expected it would be with that 5800H. We do have plenty of power. And the first thing I wanted to check out was just the wattage on this APU. It really does make a big difference. Now this is a 45 watt part and in the RZ box, it is set at 45 watts. Now one thing I'm seeing here are some higher temps when I do a quick stress test. It really seems like the fan isn't ramping up fast enough. So what I'm gonna do is go into the BIOS and see if there's any way to adjust this. But the way it's sitting out of the box and what I've tested so far, I haven't hit thermal throttle. Now I'm sure it will with this fan curve the way it's set up, but I want to go ahead and test a game. I've already got a bunch of stuff installed, so let's go with Forza Horizon 5 and see how it performs. And here it is. So we're at 1080p, low, and I've always had really good luck with APUs and Forza Horizon 5. We're actually getting an average of around 66 FPS. I haven't seen it dip below 60. I would definitely want to lock VSync on with this, but it does a good job at 1080p low. And if you did want to go up to ultra settings, it will run it at 30. But I would recommend setting it up like it is here because the game still looks great and plays just fine on this APU. Our temps have hit a maximum of 82 degrees Celsius so far with this one. Okay, so I did want to take a look at this BIOS real quick, and it looks like a lot of this stuff is unlocked. Mainly, the thing that I'm worried about is that fan control, so if we go down to AMD CBS, we can also go to MBIO common options, and from here are SMU common options. You can see that our system configuration is at 45 watts. We can go up a bit more, or we could use a third-party application to up the TDP, but the way the cooler's sitting right now, 45 watts is about the max that this whole cooling system can handle. And from fan control, we could always go full manual with it, set our low, medium, high temperatures, and our PWM. 
I'm going to mess around with this a little bit and see if I can get any better out of it. But even with this fan at 100%, doesn't seem like it would totally cool this off when this CPU is maxed out at 45 watts. But if you wanted to go through here, mess around with some of these settings, I would just be careful with it. There's a lot of stuff that can be changed in here. But I showed you the main thing that I would be worried about or would up performance if we could keep this thing cool enough. And that's the system configuration. It's set at 45 watts right out of the box. Okay, so I've adjusted the fan curve. It does help out a little bit, but we can still hit thermal throttle at 45 watts with this cooling system they have. It's just a bit too small for this 45 watt TDP. But, you know, everyday normal use, using this as an everyday PC, you're not going to hit thermal throttle. Even while gaming, it does stay out of thermal throttle. Really, when I put it in extreme loads, like running Cinebench, that's when you'll see it hit that. And with thermal throttle, it'll lower the CPU's power, kind of taking the clocks down, and in turn giving you less performance out of this chip. But, you know, using this for everyday web browsing and things like that, you're not going to have any issues with it. This can definitely do some video editing, some photo editing. You want to do some email checking. You'll have a really good time with it. 8 cores, 16 threads, and the everyday use case scenario performance of this chip is outstanding. I mean, we do have plenty of power here. But the next thing I wanted to do was take a look at a few benchmarks I ran. And the first one is PC Mark. We got a 5,867. And this really seems to be the case even for the 4000 series. When I run this benchmark on like the 4800U on up at decent wattage, it's between 5000 and 6000, so it's looking pretty normal here. Next up, we've got Geekbench 5, single core, 1458, multi, 7797. Looking really good on the single and the multi, and those Zen 3 cores are definitely playing a role here. And finally, we've got a couple GPU benchmarks. First up, 3 Mark Night Raid, got a total score of 17,093. And finally, Firestrike, coming in with a 3,948. So the GPU is running at 2000 megahertz, and really with the RAM only running at 3200 megahertz, and the TDP of this APU at 45, these are really normal. This is about what you can expect from it. If we had faster RAM, we could definitely up the performance of this GPU, but we're kind of stuck here at 3200 megahertz. But it doesn't look bad for a mini PC. Now it's time to get into a little more gaming and see how it really performs. So here we have Street Fighter V, 1080p, medium settings, looking really good. And if you take a look at the graph up in the top left hand corner, those dips are really just from the loading. In gameplay, I've seen it go down to 59, but that's about it. That's something I would never notice if I didn't have a frame counter on. Overall, it definitely handles this game really well. With the latest updates to the PC version of GTA and the newer updates for the Radeon drivers, this game has been working really well on APUs, even from the 4000 series. I've noticed a big jump in performance. Right now we're at 1080p normal, and in the past, I'd say about two months ago, we could only run this at 900p and get an average of around 66. But right now, at 1080p normal settings, we can average 73 FPS with GTA 5 on the 5800H. Newer patches for this game work amazingly with these APUs, but unfortunately with the 5800H only running at 45 watts, we're struggling to hit 60 FPS at 900p low. 720, it's good to go, and if I was able to take this up to around 60 watts, I'm pretty sure we could run it over 60 at 900p. Here we have The Witcher 3, 900p, low. This is just a really well optimized game. I know it's been on the market for a while. And if we log VSync on, we can run this at a nice steady 60. Might get a couple drops here and there, but it still looks great at 900p, and this APU can handle it. Elden Ring is just one of those games that really makes these APUs work for it. We can get an average of around 38 FPS out of this, and uh, it's definitely not 60, but we're only at 720p low. That's really how it goes with these APUs in this game here. And finally, we've got the PC version of Genshin Impact. 1080p, medium settings, if I jump this up to high, it will dip down under 60, but at medium, it runs really well at 60 FPS. 
You're not going to get 120 out of this, but looking at the game like it sits at 1080p medium, still looks great and plays just fine on the 5800H. When it comes to CPU temps in general, this idles around 39 degrees Celsius, average gaming were around 79, and the maximum that I got this to hit was 95 degrees Celsius, and that's thermal throttle. That was running Cinebench, and within 3 minutes it was at thermal throttle. Another thing I always like to take a look at with these mini PCs is total system power consumption from the wall. This idles around 12 watts. Average gaming, it pulls around 62 watts from the wall. And the maximum that I could get this to pull while maxing out all 8 cores, 16 threads, and the built-in Vega 8 GPU was 81 watts. So overall, I've always been a big fan of the RZ Box design. With the original 4800H, loved the way it looked. I also thought that they could use a little extra cooling, and with the 5800H model, I was really hoping that was going to be upgraded. At 45 watts, under normal use and even gaming, it's good. It's not going to thermal throttle on you, but once you put a load on all 8 cores and 16 threads, it can hit thermal throttle pretty quickly, so it would have been nice to see an upgraded cooler. I mean, there's plenty of room in here. And some upgraded I.O. on the front would have been nice also. But the upgrades aren't here with the 5800H version of the RZ box, and that's really a big letdown. I mean, overall performance is great for an APU. 8 cores, 16 threads at 45 watts does work out really well, given that we don't have a dedicated GPU. But those upgrades are kind of needed, because we could get a lot more out of this if we could keep that CPU cool and up the TDP to around 60. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. I really appreciate you watching. If you're interested in learning more about the new 5800H RZ box from Chewy, I'll leave some links in the description. Let me know what you think about this unit, or if there's anything else you want to see running on this, or if you want to see a cooler mod. I think I've got an idea of how to keep this thing a little cooler so we can up that TDP. Let me know in the comments below. But that's it for this one, and like always, thanks for watching.